Biographical Sketch. Chapter 1, My Childhood. I was born at Gorham, Maine, November 26, 1827. My parents, Robert and Eunice Harmon, were for many years residents of this state. In early life, they became earnest and devoted members of the Methodist Episcopal Church. In that church, they held prominent connection and labored for the conversion of sinners to build up the cause of God for a period of 40 years. During this time, they had the joy of seeing their children, eight in number, all converted and gathered into the fold of Christ. Their decided Second Advent views, however, led to the separation of the family from the Methodist Church in the year 1843. When I was but a child, my parents removed from Gorham to Portland, Maine. Here, at the age of nine years, an accident happened to me, which was to affect my whole life. In company with my twin sister and one of our schoolmates, I was crossing a common in the city of Portland when a girl about 13 years of age, becoming angry at some trifle, followed us, threatening to strike us. Our parents had taught us never to contend with anyone, but if we were in danger of being abused or injured, to hasten home at once. We were doing this with all speed, but the girl followed us as rapidly with a stone in her hand. I turned my head to see how far she was behind me, and as I did so, she threw the stone, and it hit me on the nose. I was stunned by the blow and fell senseless to the ground. When consciousness returned, I found myself in a merchant's store. My garments were covered with blood, which was pouring from my nose and streaming over the floor. A kind stranger offered to take me home in his carriage, but I, not realizing my weakness, told him that I preferred to walk home rather than soil his carriage with blood. Those present were not aware that my injury was so serious and allowed me to do as I wished. But after walking only a few rods, I grew faint and dizzy. My twin sister and my schoolmate carried me home. I have no recollection of anything further for some time after the accident. My mother said that I noticed nothing but lay in a stupor for three weeks. No one but herself thought it possible for me to recover, but for some reason she felt that I would live. A kind neighbor who had been very much interested in my behalf at one time thought me to be dying. She wished to purchase a burial robe for me, but my mother said, not yet, for something told her that I would not die. When I again roused to consciousness, it seemed to me that I had been asleep. I did not remember the accident and was ignorant of the cause of my illness. As I began to gain a little strength, my curiosity was aroused by overhearing those who came to visit me say, What a pity! I should not have known her, and so forth. I asked for a looking-glass, and upon gazing into it, was shocked at the change in my appearance. Every feature of my face seemed changed. The bones of my nose had been broken, which caused this disfigurement. The thought of carrying my misfortune through life was insupportable. I could see no pleasure in my existence. I did not wish to live, and yet feared to die, for I was unprepared. Friends who visited us looked with pity upon me, and advised my parents to prosecute the father of the girl who had, as they said, ruined me. But my mother was for peace. She said that if such a course would bring me back my health and natural looks, there would be something gained. But as this was impossible, it was best not to make enemies by following such advice. Physicians thought that a silver wire might be put in my nose to hold it in shape, this would have been very painful, and they feared it would be of little use, as I had lost so much blood and sustained such a nervous shock that my recovery was very doubtful. 
Even if I revived, it was their opinion that I could live but a short time. I was reduced almost to a skeleton. At this time, I began to pray the Lord to prepare me for death. When Christian friends visited the family, they would ask my mother if she had talked to me about dying. I overheard this, and it roused me. I desired to become a Christian and prayed earnestly for the forgiveness of my sins. I felt a peace of mind resulting and loved everyone, feeling desirous that all should have their sins forgiven and love Jesus as I did. I well remember one night in winter when the snow was on the ground, the heavens were lighted up, the sky looked red and angry and seemed to open and shut while the snow looked like blood. The neighbors were very much frightened. Mother took me out of bed in her arms and carried me to the window. I was happy. I thought Jesus was coming, and I longed to see him. My heart was full. I clapped my hands for joy and thought my sufferings were ended. But I was disappointed. The singular appearance faded away from the heavens, and the next morning the sun rose the same as usual. I gained strength very slowly. As I became able to join in play with my young friends, I was forced to learn the bitter lesson that our personal appearance often makes a difference in the treatment we receive from our companions. At the time of my misfortune, my father was absent in Georgia. When he returned, he embraced my brother and sisters and then inquired for me. I, timidly shrinking back, was pointed out by my mother, but my own father did not recognize me. It was hard for him to believe that I was his little Ellen, whom he had left only a few months before a healthy, happy child. This cut my feelings deeply, but I tried to appear cheerful, though my heart seemed breaking. Many times in those childhood days I was made to feel my misfortune keenly. My feelings were unusually sensitive and caused me great unhappiness. Often with wounded pride, mortified and wretched in spirit, I sought a lonely place and gloomily pondered over the trials I was doomed daily to bear. The relief of tears was denied me. I could not weep readily, as could my twin sister. Though my heart was heavy and ached as if it were breaking, I could not shed a tear. I often felt that it would greatly relieve me to weep away my sorrow. Sometimes the kindly sympathy of friends banished my gloom and removed for a time the leaden weight that oppressed my heart. How vain and empty seemed the pleasures of earth to me then! How changeable the friendships of my young companions! Yet these little schoolmates were not unlike a majority of the great world's people. A pretty face, a handsome dress, attracts them. But let misfortune take these away, and the fragile friendship grows cold or is broken. But when I turned to my Savior, he comforted me. I sought the Lord earnestly in my trouble and received consolation. I felt assured that Jesus loved even me. My health seemed to be hopelessly impaired. For two years I could not breathe through my nose and was able to attend school but little. It seemed impossible for me to study and to retain what I learned. The same girl who was the cause of my misfortune was appointed monitor by our teacher, and it was among her duties to assist me in my writing and other lessons. She always seemed sincerely sorry for the great injury she had done me, although I was careful not to remind her of it. She was tender and patient with me, and seemed sad and thoughtful as she saw me laboring under serious disadvantages to get an education. My nervous system was prostrated, and my hand trembled so that I made but little progress in writing and could get no further than the simple copies in coarse hand. 
as I endeavored to bend my mind to my studies, the letters on the page would run together, great drops of perspiration would stand upon my brow, and a faintness and dizziness would seize me. I had a bad cough, and my whole system seemed depilitated. My teachers advised me to leave school and not pursue my studies further till my health should improve. It was the hardest struggle of my young life to yield to my feebleness and decide that I must leave my studies and give up the hope of gaining an education. Three years later, I made another trial to obtain an education, but when I attempted to resume my studies, my health rapidly failed, and it became apparent that if I remained in school, it would be at the expense of my life. I did not attend school after I was 12 years old. My ambition to become a scholar had been very great, and when I pondered over my disappointed hopes and the thought that I was to be an invalid for life, I was unreconciled to my lot and at times murmured against the providence of God in thus afflicting me. Had I opened my mind to my mother, she might have instructed, soothed, and encouraged me. But I concealed my troubled feelings from my family and friends, fearing that they could not understand me. The happy confidence in my Savior's love that I had enjoyed during my illness was gone. My prospect of worldly enjoyment was blighted, and heaven seemed closed against me.